Ladies and gentlemen, our referee has called a stop to this contest, declaring the winner by knockout and new MMA Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting round of and new MMA show, episode 118. I am your host, Michael Hansen. I do all kinds of fantastic things with microphones because I am your ring announcer and cage announcer. Although I've never liked the term cage announcer. I always just like ring announcer, but I get it. In MMA, it's a cage. And I am joined this week, nonetheless, by my two co-hosts who bring MMA punditry to new heights. Introducing first... In New York, Mark Perillo. What's up, buddy? What's up, gentlemen? Uh, if you guys used to think I was flushed out by my lighting back in the day, we have Mike Hansen for you, baby. He's he's saving it now. But that is that is one white face <laughs> with that lighting <laughs> tonight. <laughs> I, I don't know. Guy. <laughs> I don't. I feel like this uh, camera. It's usually real good, but I have one dim lamp on over there, and it thinks that it's the sun pointing at me. <laughs> Do you always have that dim lamp on? It's, yeah. That's very weird. Uh, um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to report. Halloween was yesterday. Woo! Did did the whole deal trick or treating with the kids? They were a uh, a SWAT person and a fireman. <laughs> Swap so, man. Uh, yeah, right. What do you call it? Uh, Just a swap. So I, I had to hear about uh, 112 neighbors consecutively say, oh, I feel so safe now, each single door that we walked up to. So by the end <laughs> of the night, I wanted to just kill whoever was saying that. But uh, yeah, it was it was good Halloween. My son. You, Mike, did you trick or treat? A tiny bit. My my older guy is, uh, he's only two and a half still. So he's he's old enough to get it and kind of understand. He's super excited mm. about it, but. You know, we basically went to our next door neighbors who love him, and that's about it. He, Does uh, your neighborhood like pop off on Halloween or not really? Not really. And we had oh, my, mine is our, crazy. There's like about, hundreds of people in the street. Oh, really? But we also had yeah. like uh, our first big snow on Halloween. We got like seven oh, wow, inches. Oh, that sucks. That sucks. So that kind of really put a damper on things. My son yeah. wanted to be a boy witch, and we tried to tell him a boy witch that's is just is just called a wizard or yes. a warlock, and he was like, no, no, no. Let me tell you, it's a boy witch. <laughs> We're like, whatever, dude. <laughs> you should have simply uh, shown him the proper texts and documentation of that fact and just had him watch Harry Potter. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know Wizards if he would quite get witches. Harry Potter. He's still on like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and Mr. Rogers, but. I've never he even that first movie. Actually, I think it's on the first movie. Harry Potter, but I've never even seen like the rest. Dude, I don't think I've seen I've already, any of I've them already movies. watched all seven of them this year. We're probably going to go through all seven of them again. It's gonna really? Happen. My are sisters good? are They're obsessed. Probably I, I watched the first. Maybe I even watched the second. I can't remember. I did it like for them, and I was like, eh, I'm not loving these so much. <laughs> oh. I tell you, I would have been so much better at school if I had to do magic, bro. I would have been so good at school. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I saw the funniest <laughs> meme about Harry Potter. It's like apparently the the Harry Potter series is supposed to take place between 1993 and 1998, <clears throat> which is Correct. fucking bullshit because not once does anybody in that entire universe go, man, the Chicago Bulls are on a hell of a run. <laughs> it's the fucking UK. They don't even like baseball. Yeah, it's geez. fucking basketball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, It's Michael whatever. Jordan. Oh, did you say the Cubs? No, he's at the Bulls. Oh, I heard the Cubs. My bad. Well, whatever. They don't like the that Cubs shit anyway. The Cubs have never been on a hell of a run. Football. It's either Single football or, in Harry uh, Potter, Quidditch. That's what they care man. about. That's right, baby. All right, Quidditch let's talk about championships. Let's go. Enough, enough Quidditch. Let's talk about. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about MMA. We're going to talk about... You know, we're uh, even get introduced. I don't think so. No, oh, I'm my bad. Here, though. No, it's all Omar, good. Omar, I'm here. Omar. It's good. Omar, Omar, Omar. He's in Florida. Nicaraguan Nightmare Omar, go. Oh, Nicaraguan Nightmare got a piece of his Nicaraguan neck taken out. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Your man got a nail dug right into his fucking neck, and they took a chunk with him. 
Uh, it was good. Yo, I saw it. So we did some training with Liam Harrison uh, on Monday Oh, dude, night. I saw the pictures. <sighs> fucking awesome. Yeah. So that was how this happened. Uh, dude, we, were, so we were doing him, some work at the very end. No, no. absolutely not. I would have oh. been way more excited about that if that was a fact. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was training with one of the guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get it tattooed over <laughs> the scar. Just, just <laughs> gently take my skin from out of under his nail and just post it. Right <laughs> Ew. <there. laughs> fucking gross. No, it was dope though, man. I, I can tell you right now, watching him in person, the the same kind of crazy intensity that man has when you watch him in videos, just training, not even fighting, but just training, is just as fucking terrifying in real life. That man is like maybe five foot five, five foot six. That man will whoop everybody's ass. That Everybody, dude is terrifying. Man. Everybody, his Everybody. kicks are so fast. It's not even his kicks, dog. It's his hands. His hands and his leg kicks, specifically his leg kicks. Are ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. That Dude, that's one of the wildest things about fighting, to me, that like what is? I could walk up to some dude that's five five, so was like nine inches shorter than me, and like be a one million percent sure that he would murder me in seconds. Like it just yeah. doesn't seem like it should make sense. Yeah, <laughs> I love that about as as. Uh elite Muay Thai has become more and more, if not mainstream, just more and more in front of, in front of larger and larger audiences, mostly because of one championship guys like Liam Harrison, Rod Tang, just the most elite fucking kicking you've ever seen. The fact I could stand in front of Liam Harrison and be like, okay, Mike, try to slap Liam Harrison. And it's like, Liam kick Mike in the face. He would kick his twice. leg. <laughs> tw- he would kick me in the face twice before my hand reached yes. his face. Yes, yeah, buy that. It's scary you know stuff. One, again. it's kind of a uh, what's the word I want to use? Segue um, into one, but I feel like one almost used MMA to put it on cards to get MMA fans to tune in, and then just started sprinkling in like kickboxing and Muay Thai and grappling on these cards. And now it's hit a point where there's like one MMA fight on yeah, the cards. Yeah, right. It's like, yeah, it's we'll give you all like the other flipped. shit. We'll give you one MMA. That's that's the deal. Like, they yeah, yeah, just yeah. got away from it. You're the, right. The, the quality of Muay Thai, the quality of Muay Thai though, in one is is pretty. Fantastic. Oh, it's the best. Yeah, for sure. Oh, it's yeah. so good. Uh, okay, let me run down this show. We're gonna talk about uh, not not MMA per se this past weekend because there was no. MMA this past weekend, but there was an MMA fighter who took part in a boxing match uh, of epic proportions, which we have to talk about. Uh, we're going to go inside the MMA sphere with Omar Artola over there in Florida, telling us what is new in the world of MMA outside of the cages, what's going on in the headlines and the current events and all that. And then we're going to look ahead to this coming weekend's UFC Fight Night Almeida versus Lewis, headlined by Jonathan Almeida and Derek Lewis, a heavyweight scrap uh, that is sure to not go to the judges' scorecards. The judges are going to basically, they're going to just pack up before the main event. They're like, we're done for the night. Uh, so we might end with a little bit of trivia. Before that, guys, let's now address our audience. If you're watching this right now on YouTube, first of all, thank you guys so much. We love doing this. We've been having this conversation, the three of us. For many, many years before we ever had a show, and we said, let's just take this to the internet uh, and invite people to listen and watch and partake. So if you're on this journey with us, thank you so, so much. Uh, We appreciate each and every one of you guys. If you've been watching some of our videos or clips and you've been liking what you've been watching, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell icon so that you never miss a video. Give us a thumbs up. Cost you nothing. Very little time, about a fraction of a second, but it helps our channel out so, so much. If you like any of our takes, let us know down in the comments. But more importantly, if you disagree, and we want to hear your take down in the comments below, as always, keep it classy. If you want audio only, we've got you there. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, find us on social media, all the places, at and new underscore MMA show. All right. Let's get right into this, gentlemen. This weekend, the name on the marquee has got to be Francis the Predator in Gnu. I kind of said that. Who this past weekend lost a split decision 
against the great Tyson Fury in a boxing match in Saudi Arabia. But it was a split. And Francis Ngannou scored a knockdown on the great Tyson Fury while he himself was never knocked down or even in trouble in this fight across 10 rounds. The scorecards read 95-94 for Fury, 95-94 for Ngannou, and a 96-93 for Fury. Guys, I'm just going to say off the bat, I said this in our text, the fact that Francis Ngannou knocked Tyson Fury down and gave that man a 10 count and won this fight on one of the judges' scorecards, even in a losing split decision outcome. Oh my God, what a feather in this man's cap. His stock has only gone up this this past weekend. Mark, start us out. Give us your impressions of how this fight played out, your thoughts of how Ngannou did, of how Tyson Fury did as well. What are your thoughts? I, I don't even know what to say. Like, the <laughs> fact that we... As of as of Saturday, exists in a reality where Francis Ngannou went in there against Tyson Fury and performed the way he did and pulled off what he did. Whether you believe it was a win or believe it was a close loss, whatever it was, it was a competitive fight, which cannot be argued, against the best heavyweight boxer on the planet, who hasn't lost a fight in ages, who is who is beating and shutting down, you know, top flight opponent after top flight opponent. And now of all of these guys, the guy that gives him trouble and gives him his closest fight is, is Francis Ngannou in his first professional boxing match. Although I think he had a couple boxing matches prior to his MMA days, I want to say, but maybe they weren't pro. Not sure on that. But I remember he did have a couple. You might um, Yeah, yeah. But anyway. You know, you know what I mean. Borderline yeah. debutante in boxing. Though I hate how they make it seem like... The people in the boxing world annoy me. They make it seem like like MMA dudes have never like fought a proper fight before. And it's like, they have fought like more of a fight than any boxer has ever fought. But whatever, I, I digress. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just just the fact that he was able to pull off what he did. He He shocked the world. He bet on himself, the definition of betting on yourself and on believing in yourself, and he did what no one thought he could do. I mean, the most ardent MMA supporters did not think he could win that fight. Maybe some people thought it'd be close. No one, gun to your head, none of us were picking him. I don't know if Omar's going to say he was. I, I don't believe it. That if there was a gun to your head for your life, you're picking Francis and Ghana to win that fight. I'm sure Ariel will say he was. I don't fucking buy it either. He can support him as much as he wants. And for what it's worth, on this podcast, we never said any of that fumbled the bag shit that half of the media was saying about Ngannou. None of us ever did. So we we have been um, understanding of his decisions and pointing out how things could work out, you know, for, from the jump. And obviously they've worked out more than anyone ever imagined they would because the next boxing match that uh, Ngannou takes, he is going to get paid yeah. an absurd amount of money. But, uh, yeah, yeah he, he bet on himself, he believed in himself, and he shocked the world, and he fucking hung in there with, with Tyson Fury. And what's the craziest part to me is that he didn't really do anything that was so wild. Like, it's not like he brought yeah. something to the cage where you're like, oh, like, because he you know, fights MMA, he brought this unique aspect that Fury wasn't used to dealing with, or he did this thing. Like, he just went in there and fought a calm fight, never really went first, made Fury come to him, and relied on the fact that he is a fast, powerful, intimidating human. And, and that was really it. He countered well. You know, he, he used his size and his strength. Fury, Fury struggled with it when they were in tight. You could see Fury looked weak. He, he was getting kind of tossed around in, in tight. He he looked unbalanced, and he just looked confused as, as to what he should do to attack in, in Ganu. I mean, maybe even intimidated. I don't know if that's what I want to say, but something like that. He just he looked nothing like himself. And I know people are saying, oh, he was, you know, he took it lightly, and maybe he did. He didn't prepare, but he did have a 12-week camp. So, like, how much can you say he didn't prepare? Um, 
So I don't know. I mean, it's the definition of, of the saying of this is why you play the game or in this case, this is why you do the fight. Because sometimes shit just happens that doesn't make sense. Like, how could Tyson Fury not land his jab on Francis Ngannou? He lands it on everyone else, no matter their size, no matter their style, no matter their skill level, and he can't jab Francis Ngannou? I, I don't, I don't have an explanation for you. I, uh, I I'm waiting for our, for our boy Tommy to put something up over on Boxing breaking this down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't fully understand what Ngannou did that made Fury look as unfury like as he did. But he did it, and, and you could argue he, he won the fight. I, I will say, to close this out, that I did score it for Tyson Fury. I, I don't like the people who are, like, screaming robbery because I, I certainly don't think that there's any way you can, like, adamantly say that Ngannou won that fight. You can say you scored it for him, sure. But I, I think it, everyone should be well aware that's a very close fight and that there's a few rounds that can be flip-floppy in there. Um, and personally, I, I had it for Fury. Um, for what it's worth, for anyone that's interested, interested, I gave one and two to Fury. Three obviously was ten eight to Ngannou, so it, that's that's the knockdown, which I didn't even speak about. The fact that he fucking knocked out Tyson Fury is just it was crazy, unbelievable. It was I, crazy. Just, as as an MMA fan, I love it so much. Yeah, man. Um, so I had it even through three, and then I gave all of four, five, six to Fury. So I had him back up three. I gave seven and eight to Ngannou. So I had Fury back. I had Fury up one, and then uh, I gave Fury the last two rounds. So for me, it was ninety six, ninety three Fury on my card. You want to argue one of those and flip it? I would still have a ninety five, ninety four Fury. So for me, Fury won the fight, but uh, it, it takes nothing away from what Francis Ngannou uh, accomplished in, in my eyes. And he's going to have another huge fight coming up now, whatever yeah, it may be. Even if it's not Fury, it's going to yeah. be like fucking Anthony Joshua or something. Omar, let me send it over to you. And I had to uh, hop upstairs. My Kid is crying. Give me one second. I'll be I was right back. Are you home alone, Mike? Was. <laughs> um, my biggest thing here about the 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 Ngannou performance here was a few things. We've seen a few different MMA guys at this point do the boxing thing, right? We've seen uh, Tyron Woodley do it. We've seen Ben Askren do it. We've seen Conor McGregor do it. We've seen Nate Diaz do it. Um. Uh, Nate Diaz, I think, was the one that I think a lot of people might have had some expectation for because we've always known that he comes from a boxing pedigree. Didn't really put on the best performance, right? Um, Conor McGregor, I think we also had a expectation for because he's Conor McGregor. We just, we were on that ride. Especially back then, that was peak Conor McGregor. You know, we, we were in. Um, and we never really got, I feel like, the type of performances we... I think as an MMA fan base we're looking for, um, they had good performances for what they were able to bring to the table. But again, these guys don't boxing. Isn't really what they do on a day-to-day basis, right? You can see McGregor wasn't able to put any weight on his shots. Um, I'm, I'm not going to digress about that whole fight at this point, but my point is, is that we've, we've seen what the level of boxing is from MMA guys. And it doesn't say anything about how, what their ability is to fight. It just says how their ability is to adapt to the game of boxing, which is very specific. Francis Ngannou blew all of our expectations out of the water. I think he is safely to say the only MMA fighter that we've seen on this big of a stage that has actually looked like a boxer when he was inside of that squared circle. Um, his guard was fantastic. He was catching punches. He was not biting on a lot of feints. Um, his footwork, I thought, was really goddamn good. His distance management was pretty good. Obviously, there's the length of Fury that looks like it's a pain in the ass, even for Ngannou. Um, and I think Ngannou showed him the proper amount of respect. He didn't try to run into him as, as quickly or as recklessly as, as other people might have in the past. And at the same time, he was still able to come inside and still push the pace a little bit. Um, there has been some criticism that <clears throat> Fury could have and should have found an opportunity to push the pace on Francis Ngannou, especially in the later rounds, and that that never happened. And it's possible that he allowed, you know, he allowed Francis to fight at a comfortable pace for the later half of that fight, which is valid. Um, that's on Tyson Fury, but it's a valid criticism. I just think the, the, the beautiful thing about about Francis Ngannou is he basically just told the whole world to go fuck themselves. You're going to tell me I'm not going to do something. Oh, You're going to tell okay. me I have zero I, shot I to do it. You're going to tell me I don't look competitive at all. Um, and he went out there and arguably beat the best lineal heavyweight champion in the world. 
it's a beautiful story, especially from, especially when you put the totality of it together, right? Francis Ngannou came from quite literally fucking nothing. He talks about it all the time, right? From the scraps of Africa, built his way up to what? Probably one of the biggest now, especially, because I think his stock is higher now than he went going into that fight. So he is oh, now, God, yeah. the, he is one of the biggest combat sports people in the game right now his stock has never been higher fights are going to get thrown at him left and right both now from boxing and from mma which is also something we didn't see before no one gave a shit to watch conor mcgregor and, and floyd Mayweather too no one wants a rematch with any of these guys like jake paul or what was it jake paul and, and nate diaz we're good we don't need to see that shit again no one cares the only thing people the first thing people were talking about not the only the first thing people were talking about was run that shit back we want to see it again we have yet to see that other than Francis Ngannou when it comes to the MMA boxing crossover world. And it was beautiful. Yep. Dude, I, I was one of many who last week on this very show, I said, I think Fury's just going to put on a masterclass against Ngannou. And there were moments where I thought Ngannou looked a little lethargic, especially early on. And then he kind of like turned on his fast twitch athleticism, I feel like, mid-fight in the middle in the middle rounds but he yeah man he i also thought that he was going to come out a lot hotter in gano but fury came out hot fury came out swinging in the opening bell um yeah. and in gano the whole fight man he stuck to this game plan of be very very patient of not overextending himself and yeah he let he kind of turned into a counter puncher against tyson fury and he relied that he's gonna find a moment where his power is going to uh, be the difference maker, and God damn it, he did it. He fucking did it. But and I too, I will say this: I, not that I was like live scoring the fight round by round, but I did feel like Francis was letting Fury be more active in most of the rounds. And I thought when the bell rang, especially when Fury didn't get him out of there after that knockdown. Uh, when Ngannou didn't get him out of there. When Ngannou, yeah, sorry. When Ngannou didn't get him out of there after that knockdown, I thought, ah, I guess Fury's going to take the decision. So I kind of thought Fury won the decision just on the live watch. I, I haven't rewatched it, but yeah. Yeah, there's a couple rounds people are saying they're scoring for Ngannou that I've tried to watch a few times, and I, I don't get it personally. I just don't, I don't see it. Um, so... Yeah, I, the best I can give it is ninety five, ninety four for, for Fury personally. But again, it takes nothing away from Ngannou. And uh, just to comment on your point that that you made, Omar, um, and and you both kind of mentioned it, but about the pace, I thought that as as Omar said, I thought Fury could have maybe pushed more at times. He he definitely came out hot after he got rocked. He didn't fight the same way. I I don't know if he was just afraid of the power or what. Uh, or if he thought, you know, I I underestimated this guy. I can't. It's not that he was afraid of the power, but he was like, I can't make another mistake like that. So he tried to fight a more conservative fight. Um, but even in Ganu, like he the and the freaking announcers were making me nuts about. Oh, in Ganu, he's never fought close to this many rounds. The dude has fought twenty five minutes wrestling, <laughs> with with four minutes of break time in that twenty five minutes of wrestling. This is thirty minutes of boxing with nine minutes of break time. Like, I promise you that is infinitely less tiring than the wrestling version with half the break time. So I hate that narrative, and I never was once worried about Ngannou's cardio, and I thought he could have pushed it more, and I think he could have. I, I think that if he looked back on the fight now, that he is probably like, yeah, I was I was fine. I could have been a, a bit more aggressive. But, you know, maybe same thing. Maybe he was like, it's Tyson Fury. Let me just fucking keep doing what's keeping me safe here before yeah. I fuck anything up, too. And maybe he thought he was ahead, of course, and all that. I think he did think he was ahead. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, If they ever did fight again, it's very hard to not think that was a lightning-in-the-bottle type situation. Yeah. But I'd be curious to see how each man approached it if, if it happened again. Have you heard from Tommy at all, yourself? Just that he couldn't believe it and he's so impressed by Nganu and loves Nganu but that he also scored it for Fury. He did. I but think he had I think he had 
for fear. And I'm sure Tommy had to have been predicting a similar thing as as me of like yes a 100%. fury a fury route yes completely <laughs> i kind of want to get tommy on here to hear his thoughts but i should just wait for the next unboxing uh we could. episode we could we could but yeah i'm just so curious what happens next because the uh you've heard that that uh, fury and Usyk, i guess have now agreed it's not going to be the december date that was mentioned which i feel like everyone fucking always knew that that was a ridiculous date coming off of this encounter fight. But apparently they've agreed to a deal where it's going to be basically a two-fight deal in 2024 because it has a rematch clause for both guys. So whoever loses, I'm sure, is going to invoke it. Um, so it sounds like we're not getting Fury and Ganu rematch right away, at least, which leaves either Anthony Joshua, which I think could absolutely happen and could happen in Africa and would be fucking huge, or Deontay Wilder in either sport, because Wilder is the crazy one who keeps throwing out the idea of him doing MMA, which would blow my mind because one leg kick to Deontay Wilder's legs, and I'm not sure what he does because his oh, leg would just snap. I'm sure, yes, the leg is gone. It, that's what it would happen. <laughs> the leg is gone. So you would think it'd be boxing in, in the end, but like either of those would be fucking huge and would be such a payday. Like It's just... It's mind blowing to me that Francis Ngannou has put himself into this position where he is going to get one of these fights. But like, he, that's that's all he better get. Like him fighting anyone else yep. makes no sense because you, he has made the name he just made in this Fury fight. The last thing you want to do a, as a marketer is put him against like a you know the number eight guy, whoever it may be, and have him lose that fight, and then you lose it all. Like, you go right for Wilder or Joshua, and you do it right now. Yeah. You can't give him, like, a Dillian White or any of the guys who, no. you know, have kind of already been through the grinder of the championship kind of area and been kind of used as the cat and fodder and stuff like that. You've got to give him <clears throat> you got to give him the guys with the big names, like the Joshuas. Because they could absolutely Wilders. beat him. Yeah. I mean, it's a very popular. Anybody, anybody can I think, beat him. I think anybody That's in what the I top mean. 15, yeah. you know, I, I don't know how they totally, do I rankings agree. there, but I, I definitely would imagine yeah. most of the top guys there – have at least, if not more, than a decent chance to beating Francis Ngannou. Agree. Yeah. You you gotta. It's one of those two. No one else makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine he fucking any of those guys. beat one of those guys. Then you could oh have him God. waiting for a true title shot against the winner of Fury and Usyk. Like it's it doesn't seem like it's a real thing, but fucking here we are, man. Would you go as low as or as well? Would you do Andy Ruiz? No. no God no. 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 God, no. no, no. He's fourth. Nope. Two but, names. But the Wilder, thing is, Joshua, and, and, at the end. Anthony Ruiz, or Anthony. Andy Ruiz at this point, though, his his biggest name was Anthony Joshua, right? And I think that's really the biggest thing that he was able to do. I don't even know if he really capitalized on it too much after that. I think he had one loss after that and maybe one other win. Um, but it was a little bit inconsistent, right? Like the, the names that people are going for at this point that are going to sell – are going to be Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua. Those are the only two options at this point that you have that make sense for Francis Ngannou. I think it should be Joshua and Ngannou in Africa. I, I think Joshua is the one that he has that a good amazing. he has a good shot against Joshua. If we're being wholly honest, Joshua, and 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 when I when I say the phrase because we've, we've I've said this a lot of times that it always sounds fucking stupid when we talk about fighting in general, but Anthony Joshua does not like to get hit, right? There no, is a great. certain. If you saw the way that France, that uh, Tyson Fury got rocked, right? If you look at that face, if you if you freeze frame on the moment where Fury rolls over on the floor to get back up, he's got a face like, oh shit, that was fucked up, yep. right? He had that moment. He came back though, right? Regardless of what you want to say about who won that fight or who didn't win that fight, that fight was still closed by the end of the 10th round. Um, it was a competitive fight. We had a lot of back and forth in there. Tyson may have adjusted. He might not have fought as aggressively as he did before, whatever. But he was still very much in the fight. Anthony Joshua sometimes has a bad habit of getting cracked and then receding almost. And against Ngannou, you're just going to get knocked the fuck out if that happens. So I, I think it's a very, very interesting prospect, that fight. Because Anthony Joshua is a very technical boxer. But when he gets hit and when he gets a little beat on he tends to be less technical at that point. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm intrigued by that fight for a lot of reasons. And I know I saw a little clip of, um, 
Oh boy, mine's not working. Eddie, um, give me the last name. Eddie Hearn, boxing guy. Eddie Hearn, yeah, Jesus Eddie Hearn. God. Um, saw a clip of Eddie Hearn, uh, who I know has been given a lot of props to in Ganu, but I saw a little clip as I was scrolling Instagram of him saying that if they did ever make the Joshua fight, that Joshua would win in inside of three rounds. Yeah, he's fucking so, crazy. He d- changed despite it despite how six. impressed he was. He, oh yeah. Yeah, he changed it to six, but he's fucking crazy. He sounds exactly, and I mean exactly the same as what he said before the Ngannou Fury fight. And he's he's it's like it's like he lost one foot in that fight, and now he's like, let me put another one in my fucking mouth and see what happens there. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's just so hard. Like, if Joshua did work in Ngannou, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, that's sure. what these guys are supposed to do. You know what I mean? But. Fuck sure, man, let this guy yeah. try to shock the world again. Like I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for all of it. Fucking, um, there's, there's nothing I put past Ngannou after what I just saw. We also need to recognize the fucking brilliance of either Francis Ngannou or whoever is Francis Ngannou's manager or marketing person, because having a promotion called Gimmick Promotions is fucking <clears throat> amazing. <laughs> Doubling that down with fumble the bag as your brand for your merchandise and bags oh was it did Did he really bro you didn't see the you didn't see the fumble your bag fucking like gucci bag that this man had no no yo i'll I'll find you the picture yo he this man is the epitome of you all can go to hell i fucking love francis and the man can literally subtly in the most polite way tell the entire world to go fuck themselves i fucking love oh him. he's great i, I mean he handled it. the post fight so well so much class i loved the i mean that's that clip will live forever him knocking down fury and doing the dance over 100%. him like how fucking cool was that clip he's just he, he's the man he's the man i want to fumble the bag bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah i do too that's dope i i honestly like like bags for men you're saying like a like I a will... um it's it's almost like a here. I'm gonna send you the. the image. Is it like a designer look bag, or you mean like yeah. a duffel bag? It looks like a designer duffel bag. Like oh, one of on. those. Yeah, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> and for that reason, I'm out. <laughs> I just sent it to you. Uh, Fumbled the bag. Let's see. It's like a gym bag. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's like a leather. It, but it's, it's right. It's like a high scale. It's like a high quality. You know. It looks I, very. I make like, money. Fucking. Uh, bag. It looks, Dude. but it looks like distressed, That's like it's kind of vintage. Fucking awesome, right? Yeah. Isn't it fucking <laughs> legendary? Is he selling them though, or this is just one that he has for him? He's got to be. He's got to. He's got to be working on. I know he was saying he's working on the merchandise. I don't know if that bag oh, specifically would, is going to be for sale, one. but That's fucking amazing. I'm telling you, that it's bag so is amazing. fucking. Oh my legendary. god, <laughs> legendary. That's really cool. That's mm. really cool. Uh. Should we move on? Is there anything else you guys, any other angles of this you guys want to talk about? Uh, I think the last thing I just want to point out is really how close this fight was in terms of mass perception. Um, I went to MMA Decisions, and we talked about how this is not an MMA fight. Oh, it's on there? No one gives a shit. Everybody wants to know how you felt about this random ass fight. So, yes, it is on there. And Ganu defeats Fury for... uh, 95 to 94 40.4% and Ghana defeats Fury 96 93 which I'm not really on board with but but that's fine another 7.6%. Fury defeats Ganu from a 95 to 94 and 96 to 93 combined looks like it's about 37.2%. So according to 223 people Francis Ngannou won that fight. Yeah, it has the overall. Oh no, sorry, that's round ten. My bad, my bad. Yeah, I see where you're looking. Yeah. Ah, uh, look at the experts though. Experts on the uh, on the left six six Fury three in Ganu. Is that better? Experts. <laughs> but I mean, it is tough to go by MMA decisions because the public who frequents MMA decisions is MMA fans. So. Uh, my point though is that it's still close, right? I don't think we're gonna find oh, it's close it. as fuck. Yeah, I don't yeah. think we're gonna find it bl- blown out either way. But I think it's, I still think it's so crazy that we can even have the discussion of how close that fight was, how possible it was that Ngannou should have walked away with a belt that. Yeah, night. see this, this has a Ngannou, I, the, round two is the main round that I keep seeing people giving Ngannou, 
and I keep watching it, and I just keep not seeing it. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't get that round. To, that's such, that's a fury round to me. But yeah, I mean, hey, score it how you will. I fucking, I wanted to score it for Francis. Believe me, I wanted to come in here yeah, and tell you how he, how he got robbed. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, just didn't play that play out that way. <clears throat> but he's the man. Tell you what, the spectacle overall of this event was second to none. Oh yeah, everything about it was great. Well, the way the they just imported value. Yeah, they imported all these boxing legends and MMA legends. It was it was it was a Every, sight to behold. All the legends, yeah. man. Ronaldo was there. Every, uh uh what's his name? Yeah. Eminem was there. There's tons of people over there. Yeah, Connor what, there. What is yeah, Eminem deal? There. Does Eminem have to wear that double hood shit that he wears at at all times? Like, I feel like in five years, I haven't seen him without that double hood shit. Uh, it's like the structured like hood. hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the hat. It's like, there's like a, unless it's all one piece, but it's like there's like a structure hood underneath the loose hood. Like, I can't even it does seem describe like it. It seems like it's too hot for that shit in Saudi Arabia, right? Right. Like, what is his deal? Like, did someone take a chunk out of the back of his head? Like, what can we see his head? I don't, it's very strange. I think it's for his, like, just comfort. It's, hasn't he always been, like, a very introverted guy i mean yeah but like we used to see his head quite often like he's still just, unmistakably eminem i know but like it's just i don't know it's strange to me it's strange that he watched a whole boxing event with a double hood over his head well guys uh i fucked with my lights it's not any better nope yeah your room fact, is darker I'm... and you're just still lit up and it, and it keeps trying to focus on i don't what this is it's not going well. It's not going well at all. <laughs> Look like Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's uh, shift topics now from the boxing world back over to the world of mixed martial arts. And uh, let's go into our, our segment, Inside the MMA Sphere. Omar, give us the update on all of the happenings in the world of mixed martial arts outside of the cages. What's in the news? All right, so we've got a few interesting things that done happened in the last week. The biggest one, PFL has officially acquired Bellator. They own Wait, the what? Supposedly they own it the happened. promotion and will be taking when? over January 1st, 2024. The plan is to run the Bellator brand for the next two years. And then When what? did this news break? That's the I most confusing this... part of I found this online uh, about a couple of hours ago. Oh, I saw it like what? A, a day or two ago. How has this not crossed my fucking plate? I'm sure because there's no, there hasn't been an official announcement yet from any party. So wow, I'm sure we'll yeah, probably we'll see this. I know first it has. It, you know it says first reported by your boy Mike. Yeah. Oh Ben Davis. Todd Atkins. Oh Todd no, it's Todd Atkins. Atkins. <laughs> Mike's got too no, many fucking Davis. boys now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it says um, it's going to run Bellator for two more years? Yeah, I'm confused by the way that this is phrased. And then what? Like it like what do you so they're going to run Bellator and Bellator is, is still just going to be Bellator and do Bellator things for two more years and then what? Might then be folded is, together. Yeah, I would imagine they're probably just trying to probably use the two years to build up the brand a little bit, maybe trim the fat, get the fighters that matter. Uh, on there and promoted properly, and then import them into PFL. Yeah, Why do they says, just do that now? It says whatever whatever this means. It says it, this is not explicitly stated, but PFL would likely run Bellator until 2026 due to previous agreements that are in place. Oh, okay. so like I don't know what that and stuff means exactly, but yeah, I would hope that means we are still able to be like. Hey, let's make fucking Kayla Harrison fight Chris Cyborg, right? Like you would think they could still do that. My thing, my guess is that they probably. I think with the with the ability to have Bellator and PFL at the same time, then they can double up on the shows as well. So they can still build more fighters in less time instead of having multiple PFL shows and potentially oversaturating that specific product. And then you can you can sure. still have Bellator, you can have PFL. Because eventually, once they merge, they're going to have to cut people from both rosters. And I think they're probably, oh, yeah. you know, 
Yeah. Especially if they already have contracts and they already have uh, engagements that are already set and stuff like that. It's a great opportunity to just let fighters kind of make their case for why they should be part of whatever this new brand will be in 2026. And then and then go from there. But it, it's super I just mean as though. fans, I feel like the thing we're excited about is these crossover fights. And yeah. if this news means we ain't going to get them, then that fucking blows. Makes you wonder how easy it might be to have a crossover promotion, you know, like the way that they've done Bellator and Ryzen. Oh, they could do that. We maybe, could do a Bellator say, like, PFL like the, the end of the year. Versus, yeah. You know, July 4th, you know, to maybe not to compete necessarily with International Fight Week, but maybe to add on to, you know, a July month of big fights, they can do, you know, PFL and Bellator yep. crossover. Definitely. That's a good point. They could do it like that. Uh, all right, a couple of updates on injuries. Hamza Chemaev has a torn hand ligament, not a broken hand, uh, but the ligament is messed up in his right hand. He will need four weeks in a brace and will not need any surgery. So good on him. That's that's probably best case scenario, frankly, for him at this point. Um, John Jones officially had surgery for that torn. Yeah. I keep wanting to say bicep. It's not his bicep. It's his pec. Pec. Pectoral. Yes. Uh, so he finally has surgery on it. Surgery would, looks like it was a success. There's no updated timeline on recovery. Um, so it still looks like they're still banking for somewhere between four to eight months unofficially. Ian Gary has been barred from training with Team Renegade. Uh, so it looks like uh, it looks like Ian Gary was training with Team Renegade, at, who is home of Leon Edwards and company. Uh, apparently there may have been some disagreements on where Ian Gary is allowed to train at this point that Ian Gary basically said that they're worried about, uh, Ian Gary being a threat, uh, in the division and potentially threatening yep. the future of Leon Edwards and his training and his confidence and things like that. Uh, Leon Edwards coaches have basically said that Ian Gary's nomadic, style of going from camp to camp doesn't really resonate with how they're tra how they're planning on building a team and training so they basically just said that we just don't want him here anymore <laughs> so so that's that i'm sure we'll see a nice grudge match between ian gary and leon edwards sometime in the near future now um but until then mm -hmm. i would not expect to see any training videos of them together yeah to me all that means is that they have recognized that Ian Gary is here. Like, it shouldn't be a shock to him. Yep. 100%. If anything, 100%. it should be a compliment to him. Yeah. Totally. All right. Oh, Next on the list, okay. Zufa has been denied the appeal in the UFC antitrust case. Uh, so if you guys have been following along, the uh, there have been a lot of former fighters between the years of 2010 and 2017 that have been uh, – that have – officially gotten class uh, status in a class action lawsuit against the UFC or against Zufa specifically, um, basically accusing the UFC of suppressing fighter pay and using anti-competitive schemes to shut out rivals and control the market for elite MMA fighters amongst a bunch of other, I guess, smaller charges or whatever. But that's basically been the argument is that they've uh, monopolized essentially the, the MMA world and pay, and, and pay structure and things like that and didn't allow people to thrive as much as they wanted, especially after the Venom deal, or I'm sorry, the Reebok deal, um, that essentially stunted a lot of sponsorship and things like that. So um, once that class status was given, that basically allows every fighter that qualifies between a certain time frame to be part of that class and essentially make that that um, that argument stronger. But one of the things, one of the tactics that that the Zufa team was using was to try and decertify that class and essentially make each by decertifying that class, you would have to have each individual case run um, and, and fought out as opposed to doing it as one whole case. So they lost that appeal. It is still very much a class action lawsuit at this point. So it's kind of an L at this point for Zufa uh, and a win, a small win at this point uh, for your MMA fighters. And for those of you who are unaware of who's in there, cause it's a little bit, a little bit around the OG side, so if you're just getting into MMA nowadays, you might not know who some of these guys are, but guys like Kung Lee, for example, John Fitch, Kyle Kingsbury. Um, I think there are a couple other guys. I can't remember the one guy from Tough now that was been on it for quite some time. Um, 
I can't remember. But there's a lot of guys that are involved in this uh, class action lawsuit. So it's definitely still ongoing. We'll definitely give you more updates as things go along. But UFC is taking a, a small L with the fighters taking a small W. All right. We have a couple of fight announcements, literally just a few, and then we will move right along. Matt Schnell is out of his fight against uh, Steve Ersig. Steve Ersig will now be facing Alessandro Costa at UFC 295 on November 11th. Dan Hooker versus Bobby Green has officially been announced for UFC Austin on December 2nd. This is a five-round light heavyweight bout. It is not a main event, uh, but it will be co-headlining that uh, that night. The headliner will be Benil Dariush versus Armin Sarukian. That fight will be going Whew. down also at light he- at the light heavyweight. No. At I was, was going to say, did you say light heavyweight when you were saying Hooker <laughs> Green? I think you did. Maybe. If they're both lightweight. I wasn't sure if you be, did or not. It should be lightweight. I don't know if I said light heavyweight. Uh, but mm. both of them are going down, uh, again, headlining, co-headlining on December 2nd. And the last little bit of information we have for you this week is Phil Hawes versus Bruno Ferreira. That has been added to UFC's Vegas 83 card on January 13th. <clears throat> I would have to imagine this has got to be Phil Hawes' last hurrah if he... If he fucks up here, I can't imagine he sticks around. What, has he lost two in a row? I'm not remembering who was before. Am I bugging? Do I just yes. feel like Phil Hawes just yes. keeps losing? Yes. Oh, he has I, lost two in a row. I agree. Yeah, dog. He's yeah, lost delivered. three of his last four. Yeah. And the guy, I mean, the only before... guy that he's beaten is a man that was like half his size. But before that, he had won three in a row. He's four and three in the UFC. And beat Nasruddin Mavov, and now can't win a fight to save his fucking life. He's fighting yeah, beasts. I mean, he's fighting. He's fighting. Yeah, beasts. he's it's fighting good dudes. I would hope yeah. he's not cut. Who is it? Bruno Ferreira. Yeah, that, but that's I that's mean, what possible. I mean. It's yeah. It's not. It's not impossible. He's going down the ladder for sure. You know. And it's another guy who could knock him out too. Yeah, very much so. Phil Hawes is one of those guys that you got to wonder if. Like the chin is a real thing because it, he looks like he just gets turned off. Like he doesn't even look like he's got an option. He just goes yeah, out. True. It's crazy. But he's so talented, yeah. man. He's he's a dangerous yeah, I agree. guy. He's I, agree. He, I don't I don't know if talented is the word I would. He is athletic. He's athletic. But there, there's oh, there's on, guys that are talented athletic. in striking and in talented specifically in, in areas of expertise. But the thing I've always gotten from Phil Hawes is that the man is very athletic. But I don't know if that fight IQ is there. And, and for me, the fight IQ, I think, is a big part of, of talent as well. Oh, that was well, it. That was all I had. Tell us. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, what else? What else you got? That was it. We're good. Oh, you're, oh that, okay. That's you're it. done for the sphere. Sphere okay. done. Over. Closed. Okay. It might be, guys, it might be another week where we get out of here before midnight. Let's do it, baby. Let's get out of here before. Let's do it, man. (laughs) Okay. All right. This coming weekend, uh, Derek Lewis and Gilton Almeida will be facing off in the main event of UFC Fight Night 231. UFC Fight Night, Almeida versus Lewis. Going down in Sao Paulo, Brazil, this this, uh, Saturday night, November 4th. Here we go. Before we talk about I, how many we how many are we going to talk about? About eight or so, seven or eight. I think it's eight from this card. Are there any other yeah, fights eight. or fighters that you guys want to quickly spotlight for our listeners and viewers and be like this guy? Make sure you watch this fight. No, Mark, I, Omar, Mark. Honestly, dude, you got to just watch the whole card. The card is actually pretty solid, uh, all things considered, yeah, from is. top to bottom. Um, there, there's some really good <clears throat> matchups on here from a stylistic standpoint. I mean, there's uh, I'll let Mark run through. A lot of them, because there's there's really a lot of good ones. Um, Maserat Ruiz. Go is ahead. On I'm here. just going to say a couple. Conejo's on here. She's kind of a hit or miss. Uh, but the, the one thing I will say about Conejo, she's generally always there to scrap. Mark DeCasey, again, always there to scrap. A uh, little bit more of a wrestler than he has been a striker, but we'll see how he kicks off the night. Angela Hill is there. Beast, always. We're, do- we're doing Angela Hill's fight. Oh, correct. Right. She's just so low on the list, which seems fucking ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But we're not, you know, we have. I feel like every week we're complaining about people and their place on the Ross on the fight card. <laughs> um, Modestus Bukowskis is on here. Dana Marcos is on here. Elves Brenner. If you don't know who Elves Brenner is, you might want to educate yourself. That dude had a really good debut. 
very, very interested to see where he goes now that he's gotten uh, what I would imagine is a full camp. Um, so, yeah, a lot of good fights, man, from top to bottom. Definitely recommend watching. Yeah, I agree. The girl who's debuting against uh, Conejo is Eduarda Mura, who is undefeated and uh, really good grappler. So she's she's somebody to keep an eye on if she can get a debut in there. <clears throat> and then the dude who is – so Daniel Marcos, who, who Omar mentioned – he is the one that beat Davy Grant in in his debut or in his second fight, I believe it was, which was fairly controversial. But I, either way, I had a very close fight with Davy Grant, who's obviously very good. But he's fighting a guy named Victor Hugo, who I've kind of been educating myself on a little bit. I didn't know him prior to looking into this card, but um, I don't want to call him a journeyman, but like a veteran who has been around a lot of promotions, been fighting for a while, but hasn't lost in years and years and years. Finisher can fin- can tap you, can knock you out. Seems like one of these guys. Almost like a Victor Henry type who, like, finally made to the, made it to the UFC and you might realize, like, should have been here for quite a while already. So I'm interested to see that that fight between Hugo and Marcos. That could be a fun fight. And, um, yeah, the Petrino Bukowskis one is a good one. Petrino's obviously looked like a stud so far. So, yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of solid fights, even the ones we're not going to fully go through here. All right, boys, let us kick off our discussion. In the women's strawweight division, Angela Hill taking on Denise Gomes. I hope I'm saying that name right. I know she is Brasileira. Uh, Angela Hill, overkill. Angie Hill, the 38-year-old from San Diego, California. Her pro record stands at 15-3 and three with five knockouts. And she's very much looking to get back to her winning, we- winning ways after a decision loss to... Uh, the star, Mackenzie Dern. She'll be standing across from Denise Gomes, the 23-year-old out of Brazil, 8-2 and two as a pro thus far with six knockouts on her record. Back-to-back wins coming into this weekend after winning on Contender Series. She lost her official UFC debut, but now has won back-to-back fights coming into this Saturday night. Mark, go first. Give us your take and your pick of Angela Hill versus Denise Gomes. All right, so close odds here. Angela Hill is barely an underdog, but she is. She is plus 105. And Denise Gomes, despite being the more unproven fighter of the two, is favored. She's minus 125. Um, There is one inch of height and one and a half inches of reach on the Angela Hill side of things. I actually thought it was going to be more than that in height. I feel like Gomes is not tall in my head, but uh, I guess Angie's not quite as tall as I'm imagining. Uh, But, yeah, it's it's a close fight. Gomes has looked really solid thus far. She, of course, finished Omar's girl in, in uh, Yasmin Haragui. Har- Har- um, but Angela Hill is a different type of test. I, I Obviously, Haragui is very talented, but we have seen Angela Hill in there with top flight girls for years and years at this point. I don't know that I've seen enough from Denise Gomes to be picking her over a girl like Hill. I get why she's favored. At least in a way, I, I get why she's favored. But, you know, Angie's won our arguable decisions over girls who are, like, top five yeah. level. So yeah. I'm I'm going to go with her. She's very hard to hurt. We've seen that over the years. No one really gets Angela out of there with strikes. And I'm going to trust her more, even if she does get cracked a couple times, to be the one to to navigate this fight, to lean on her advantages, to dictate the action more so to not allow Gomes to get going with anything that's big momentum and uh, and to take at least two of these rounds. So I will say Angela Hill, UD. Okay, Omar, your take and pick for Hill versus Gomes. I think it's <clears> – <throat> I think we've always made ourselves pretty clear that we are a generally an Angela Hill-esque podcast here. Uh, and we yeah, generally man. pick Angela Hill. However, uh, Denise Gomes fucked up my girl. So I feel like – I can't really pick against her, at least for this specific next fight afterwards. I I need to be on the Denise Gomes train here. I do think it's very difficult to take Angela Hill out. I do think um, Angela Hill has so much more experience, obviously, in the cage that will work to her favor. However, Denise Gomes is powerful, man. And Angela Hill, you know, while she's a scrapper, has never really done well taking power shots. Uh, and I think I think Nisi Gomes is going to be riding that power train. 
Um, so I'm going to go with Denise Gomes here. I don't know if she gets her out of there, but I do think that she's able to take two out of the three rounds. So Denise Gomes, unanimous decision. Don't don't sleep on a potential yep. TKO, though. The girl's got really heavy hands. Yeah, Angela Hill is uh, technically old enough to be Denise Gomes' mother, uh, about 16 or 17 years older than Gomes here. Angela Hill, little, 38 years old. Gomes. It's a little wild, Mark. Excuse I mean, me. That, that, 16, 7. I mean, that's wild. Could be. That's wild. <laughs> what, what, what's wild? What do you mean? Just like, I guess she could have had her at 16 and still been her mother. I don't know if I would. I mean, biologically old enough to be. No? I guess it's so. Totally I don't mean possible. it to be insulting at all. No, I. It's, it's... I just mean it to, to drive home the point of their difference in age. Denise Gomes, 23 years old. Angela Hill, 38. Um, you guys know that I love Angela Hill myself. Uh, this is not a spot in which I'm going to be picking her. Uh, Mark makes a great point. Angela Hill is not one that usually gets finished with strikes. I don't think Denise Gomes is going to finish her with strikes, but I do see her perhaps having Angie Hill in trouble once or twice throughout this fight and coming away with, let's say, a 29-28 scorecard in favor of Gomes. Give me Gomes by UD. Oh, wait, I'm not tra tracking our picks the way I usually do. You both took Gomes, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okie doke. Got it going now. Okay, next up, we go to the welterweight division with Eliza Zaleski Dos Santos taking on Renat Fakradinov. This is a fight that I cannot wait to watch. So Dos Santos, whose nickname is Capuera, love that nickname because Capuera's fucking cool. The 36-year-old out of Brazil, he's 24-7 and seven as a pro with 17 finishes, 14 of them being knockouts or TKOs. He's riding back-to-back -back wins coming into this weekend, most recently a split decision win over... Abubakar Nurmagomedov back in June of this year. He'll be standing across from uh, another very, very talented Russian in Renat Gladiator Fak Redinov, uh, the 32-year-old out of Moscow, Russia. His record stands at 21-1 and with 17 finishes, 11 of those being knockouts. He has not lost a fight since his second pro fight back in June of 2013 so we're talking the man has not lost a fight in a literal decade uh okay omar start us off this time give us your take and your pick fakrinov versus zaletsky dos santos i gotta say man this is one of those one of those really really good fights that i'm super interested in both guys are very very talented uh zaletsky dos santos is a very talented striker the thing that i think is going to send me is sending me over the edge one over the other is Renat's performance against Kevin Lee and against Brian Battle for that matter. So regardless of the level uh, that you might consider Brian Battle at or even Kevin Lee in his later stage of his career, the performances themselves from Renat were pretty spectacular. He completely dominated Brian Battle and, you know, Brian Battle for, for all the unorthodox things he's done or does in the cage doesn't really lose. Uh, and it's not, mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't really get dominated like that. He doesn't really get bell to bell worked. Um, and he did by Renat in pretty aggressive fashion. And Kevin Lee, he just completely ruined in that fight. So I, the performances themselves to me speak a little bit more uh, to what I expect to happen more than the fact that Delescos, uh, Delescos, that Dos Santos has been in there for probably two, maybe three times the amount of uh, cage experience than Fakhradinov has. Uh, but I don't think it'll matter, man. I think Fakhradinov is going to come, and I think he's going to eat. So I'm going to go with Fakhradinov here uh, by submission, round three. Mark, you're up. He's a pretty big favorite, so it shows you how high people are on Fakhradinov. He is minus 370, and uh, Zaleski is plus 280 as the dog. Uh Nearly the same size, one inch of height, one inch of reach for Renat. I love Zaleski Dos Santos. You guys know this. I, I truly think with different matchups, 
a little bit different timing and, and maybe more of a push behind him that he could have been a top level talent and been having some big fights by this point in his career. Um, I, I think that he's good everywhere, but he is now 36 and he is fighting Renat Fakradinov. And from what I've seen from Renat thus far, I don't know that I'm ready to pick anyone, not even a guy that I love to, to beat him. So I'm not going to do it. I, I do think it's interesting because Zaleski is dangerous in a lot of places, and if he could ever stop or not from being able to fight his fight, I think this could get really interesting real quick. And we've seen him nullify the wrestling of guys like Abubakar and Benoit Sandini, who he destroyed. Uh, granted, Sandini's a weight class down now. Um, so we know it's it's possible, but I'm just inclined to believe that the wrestling of Renat is a cut above these guys. And I have to say that he gets this done. So he'll have to earn it, but I'm going to say Renat UD. Yeah, we are definitely in agreement here. Uh, I, b- piggybacking off something you said, Mark, I, I, I'm not ready to pick against Renat Fakhradinov until he is facing probably ranked uh, uh, top 15 ranked opponents. That would kind of give me pause. At this point, I think he's just going to keep marching up into the rankings. I'm just curious, Mark, uh, how close is he to the top 15 in your rankings? Renat, you said? Is he knocking on the door? Yeah. Sorry, I was getting the text that I was reading. Um, okay. I don't have my rankings open. So here, oh, they open super fast. Renat is 24. Okay. Okay. I'm just curious, where is uh, Dos Santos for you? 34. All right. Uh, yeah, give me uh, give me Fakhradinov by UD. I too am a fan of uh, Zaleski de Santos. I think he's a super talented welterweight, but ain't gonna get it done over Fakhradinov, man. I don't know who is at this point in his in this uh, stage of his career. Let's go on now to the lightweight division. Ishmael Bonfim taking on Vince from Hell Pichel. Bonfim, the 27-year-old, out of Brazil, 19-4 and four as a pro with 13 finishes, nine of them knockouts. Looking to get back in the win column after Benoit Saint-Denis handed him a surprising submission loss back in July of this year, putting a momentary halt to the Ismael Bonfim hype train coming into the UFC. Uh, so he's now, after winning on Contender Series, he's now 1-1 one and one in the UFC after finishing Terrence McKinney with a flying knee in the second round back in January of this year. Uh, let's see. Vince from Hell Pichel, the 40-year-old out of California, 14-3 and three as a professional with eight finishes, also looking to get back in the win column after dropping a decision to Mark Madsen back in April. Uh, I will go first, gentlemen. Uh, this is a matchup for me that I think is made to be an exciting one, but one also for Ismail Bonfim to hop right back in the win column. Uh, I will take Bonfim. I, I, I think he's going to be very motivated, and I think he finishes Vince Bichel, uh handing him his second TKO loss. And I will say it's going to come in the second round. Mark, why don't you go first, or second now? Okay, Bonfim is a big favorite despite coming off the loss. He's minus 520. Uh, Vince Pichel is plus 380 as the dog. Two inches of height and one inch of reach for Vince Pichel. And, yeah, he's never an easy night. He, he's no walkover for Ismail to bounce back against after his loss to Benoit saint But I do think Bonfim gets him. I, I don't think Pichel is a good enough wrestler to have enough success there against Bonfim, which means he's going to end up in exchanges on the feet. And Bonfim is quicker there. He's more dangerous there. He hits harder. And I think he clips Pichel at some point. So I am going to go Ismail Bonfim, round two, knockout. Okay, Omar. I love this fight for Bonfim. A little terrified of this fight for Pichel. 
Uh, like Mark said, you know, Pichelle is definitely not an easy out, but there is something very crisp about Bonfim striking. And, you know, the fight with Marco Madsen um, was one that was heavily dominated by the wrestling. Um, and I'm sorry, that's Pichelle, not Bonfim. Benoit Saint-Denis, wrong wrestler. Um, was definitely dominated by the wrestling still, and obviously he ended up putting himself into a, a pretty bad position that allowed him to get choked out. I, like Mark kind of alluded to, I don't think Vince Michelle kind of has that ability or won't have that ability, at least not against him. And I think he kind of gets pieced up here, man. I don't think it's going to be very easy. I don't think it happens early, but I do think it happens, and I do think he gets finished. So I think I'm on the I'm on the same train as Mike here. Uh, I'm going to go with Bonfim by TKO here at the, probably the end of round two. <clears throat> okay. Love Pichelle's nickname, got to say. What a fun, creative nickname from hell. Okay, going to now the the middleweight division. Rodolfo Vieira taking on Armin Petrosian. Uh, is it Rodolfo? Yeah. Or yes. Rodolfo. Hodolfo. It's Rodolfo. 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 Uh, let's see. So Vieira, the black belt hunter, the 34-year-old out of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. His record stands at 9-2 and two with 8 of his 9 victories coming by way of submission, earning that nickname each and every time he steps into a cage. He's 4-2 and two thus far in the UFC, most recently submitting. Cody Brundage uh, back in April of this year. His only two losses in the UFC middleweight division came at the hands of Anthony Hernandez and Chris Curtis. Armin Petrosian, the 32-year-old out of Armenia, 9-2 and two as a pro with six finishes. Uh, all, of, all six of those are knockouts. Coming off back-to-back -back wins in the UFC over A.J. Dobson and Christian Leroy Duncan, both decision wins. Uh, the, the win over Duncan came... In June of this year, and now he's stepping back in the cage against Adolfo Vieira. Omar, give us your take and your pick. I really like Armin Petrosian here, man. Um, I think Adolfo Vieira has obviously the, the jiu jitsu pedigree, but Armin Petrosian is not a guy that's very easy to take down. Um, and at the same time, his striking is really, really crisp. And Vieira has already shown kind of very similar things where when he gets hit, doesn't really like it all too much. Um, and Petrosian is one of those guys that's that's going to piece you up if you give him the opportunity to. So I do think Petrosian is going to come out on top here. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there's some kind of grappling nonsense that Vieira is able to capitalize on, but I don't see that happening very quickly or, or even really at all personally. So I'm going to go with Petrosian here. Um, I don't think it's a finish, but I do think it's a unanimous decision. I'll go next. I, I like the Brazilian here. I think uh, Petrosian... Uh, has never been submitted, but he's not a submission artist himself. And I think that the Black Belt Hunter is going to claim another another scalp here. Give me Vieira by submission, I'll say, in the third round. Mark? Dead even fight, odds-wise, as uh, people may not be shocked to hear after hearing you two being split on it. But both guys are minus 110 on the odds. Uh, three inches of height for Petrosian, but two inches of reach for Vieira. Uh, really interesting fight to me. Both are big, strong dudes. Obviously, it's a big style clash. The, the question is just who you think can implement it. If Petrosian can stop the takedowns, uh, he wins. If Vieira can force himself inside the strikes of Petrosian and manage to drag him down, he wins because as long as this fight is in the striking, it's going to favor Petrosian significantly. And if it hits the mat, it is going to be all Vieira. So it's a tough call. I think Vieira gets somewhat underrated because of a couple shaky performances he's had, but he can be very on at times as well. But I'm going to use the, the Kyle Bahalio fight as kind of the barometer here. And if Petrosian could do as well as he did in that fight, then I don't think there's any reason he can't replicate that in this one or possibly do even better. So I'm going to say he can he can nullify enough, keep himself safe enough, lean on the striking, obviously, and, and win a UD. Okay. 
All right, we go to uh, the middleweight division, Kayo Bahalio versus Abus Magomedov. So Bahalio is the 30-year-old out of Brazil. His record stands at 14-1 with one no contest. Eight of his 14 wins coming by way of finish, four knockouts and four subs. Uh, he has not lost a fight, similar to Vernat Fakhrdinov. He has not lost a fight since his second pro fight which was back in 2015. He won back-to-back -back fights on the Contender Series in 2021 and is now 4-0 under the UFC banner, most recently finishing by a rear naked choke, uh, Mikhail Olesheyjuk, back in April of this year. He'll be standing across from Abus Magomedov, the 33-year-old out of Russia. His record stands at 25-5 and with one draw. Uh, 20 of his 25 wins have come uh, by way of finish, 14 of those being knockouts. Most recently, after busting into the UFC, finishing Dustin Stol uh, Stolf how do you say his name? Stolfus? Stoltzfus. Stoltzfus. Uh, in 19 seconds, he got matched up with Sean Strickland maybe a bit too early. I was super high on Abus from seeing what I saw out of him in that in that opening bout. But Strickland uh, put a stop to that one and made me look <clears throat> real bad with that pick. Uh, and he's looking to get back to his winning ways and finishing ways over the very tough, also rising prospect in Kyle Bahalio. Mark, start us off this time with the odds, and then you can give us your take and your pick. All right, the odds. Uh, Kyle Bahalio is a decent favorite. He's minus 290. Uh, Abus Magomedov is plus 220 as the dog. Uh, he is, uh, he being Abus, is one inch taller and has a three inch reach advantage. He's still incredibly hard to evaluate. Like, just because he got stopped by Sean Strickland, who is now the champ, does not mean that he's not a very good fighter. But man, I've believed in Kyle Bahayo this whole time, and I'm just having an easier time siding with him than I am siding with Abus. And I may very well be wrong because the striking probably does go to Abus here, and... If his wrestling can keep him out of bad positions on the mat, which it very well could, it's not like Bohayo is so dominant at getting positions, um, then how does Kayo win the fight? But I'm still going to go Kayo. I just I think he can hang well enough on the feet. He's shown that before against guys like Petrosian, who I just mentioned. Maybe be losing, but find an opening as this fight goes on. Maybe expose some cardio by forcing... A boost to defensively wrestle. Uh, we know his cardio has been suspect before and find an opening to finish this fight. So I'm going to say Kayo does it late. Round three sub. Omar, you're up. Kayo reminds me of like a Brazilian Johnny Cage, doesn't he? Dude, he's just, yes, you're so right. right? Like, if, like if Mortal Kombat. I'm looking at his photo on SureDog right now. Yeah. It looks just like Johnny Cage. It's exactly who he reminds me of. Um, and he kind of fights a little so crazy right. too. Um, I think it's a great matchup. To be honest, this is another another great fight uh, on this card. Both guys, I think, have very similar avenues of beating each other to hell. Um, I think Bahradio though has, you know, we've seen him run into a little bit of trouble, but we've also seen him still persevere and come back and still win two out of the three rounds. I think this is going to be very similar to it. I don't think we're going to see Abus get his ass whooped the way that he did against Sean Strickland. But I do think that it's very possible that Borrello is going to be the stronger guy in there. And I think if there do if we do get two clinch exchanges, I think Borrello has a good chance of being able to come out on top of them. So I'm going to go Borrello here. Uh, I don't think he finishes Abus. I think Abus is kind of a beast uh, and very durable, all things considered with that Sean Strickland fight. But I'm going to go Borralio here by unanimous decision. Dude, I'll be honest. I was high on a boost, man. I was real high. And I'm a little hurt. I was a little burned by by that Strickland fight. Uh, so I will not be picking a boost here. Uh, oh, no, but here, gonna... no. Um, he's got to earn my trust back. <laughs> uh, um, but I think that that Bahalio is a super talented middleweight and really a rising star in, in the division. Um, so the thing from the Strickland fight that I, that I thought was the most, I guess, eye-opening and was sort of new information because Abus 
has a lot of firepower at middleweight. But I think what Strickland exposed to a certain extent was that he didn't have the best gas tank for 185 pounds. So I think that uh, Bahalio, uh who's a very different fighter from Sean Strickland, but I think that uh, he's going to take advantage of that uh, gas tank issue for a uh, boost. And I think, I think Mark, you, you made a similar pick. I think he uh, is going to drag him into deeper waters later in the fight. I'll take a third round finish as well for Kyle Bahalio. I'll say TKO. I think you said sub. Yeah, I did. Okay. Here we go. Up to the heavyweights. Rodrigo Nasi Mento taking on Dante Mays. So, Nasi Mento, Yogi Bear is his nickname. Is the 30 year old out of Brazil, 10 and 1 with one no contest, with eight finishes on his record, six of those submissions. Uh, let's see. After winning on. Contender Series, he is now 3-1 and one with one no contest in the UFC. Most recently, a split decision win over Elir Latifi back in May of this year. Dante Mays, Lord Kong, the 31-year-old out of Louisville, Kentucky. As a pro, he is 10-5 and five with one no contest. Seven finishes, six of them knockouts. His last fight was a knockout victory over the veteran Andre Arlovsky. All right. Omar, start us off. Give us your take and your pick between these two big boys, Nascimento and Mays. You mean? Yeah, sorry. We should be pointing out that this is actually a rematch. Uh, Nascimento and Dante Mays have actually fought once oh, back right. in 2020, uh, right at the kind of at the, in, the the beginning of the pandemic uh, in May of 2020 when things were just starting to get going uh, from the UFC from the pandemic issues. Um, and things didn't go well for Dontel Mays. Uh, he got taken down and he got choked out. I can't imagine that there is going to be anything different about this fight personally. I don't know anything about Dontel Mays' last few performances that would make me think that he could stop Nascimento from doing relatively the same thing that happened in the first fight. Um, with that being said, I'm going with Nascimento here. Round two, submission. Mark? So Nascimento's the favorite. He's minus 190. Maze is plus 155. Four inches of height and one inch of reach for Dante Maze. I'll be honest, I didn't even realize this was a rematch until I started looking into it. I completely forgot they even fought before. Probably because neither guy has had too memorable of a UFC career to this point, so that fight just didn't stick in my head. But I really forgot they even fought. Um, and I think the UFC might have forgotten too, because why, why make this rematch? Like, why did it need to happen right now? I feel like there were fresher opponents that could have made sense. It's a very random rematch. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, like Omar said in the first one, Nascimento was able to drag Maze down and sub him and also like Omar said I don't really have any reason to think that is going to change like all right Maze has been figuring out his game a little bit more we know he does carry power he's very big but I don't think any of that prevents him from getting taken down and getting tapped again at some point in this fight so I will say Rodrigo Nascimento round three sub not to mention really quick that that yeah. No, uh, that Maze hasn't really even fought anybody that's tried to even implement a similar game plan as Nascimento. So it's not even like you can say, since Nascimento's fight, I've seen his takedown defense get this much better. Right. Or I've seen his submission right. defense get this much better. He's just fought a bunch of guys that have just stood and banged with him. And he, even then, he's sort of not done crazily amazing, you know? Agreed. Yeah, we are agreed. We are in... Uh... We were unanimous for this one, guys. Uh, kind of an easy pick for me. I think uh, Nascimento also takes him down again. I don't. I don't think that. I've seen this is vast improvement in Dante Mesa's ground game. So I'm going to say Nascimento finds a way at some point in this fight, uh, as long as he avoids something like a huge shot from Mays, gets Mays to the ground, goes to work. I'll take late <clears throat> round one submission for Nascimento. We've been unanimous on every fight except one. And I don't think that's going to change on these last two. 
Okay. Can't imagine it would. All right, co-main events between Gabriel Bonfim and Nicholas Dalby. So Bonfim, the brother of the other Bonfim, who we talked about <laughs> 20 minutes ago, is 26 years old, also out of Brazil, undefeated 15-0, and all 15 wins are finishes. Not one of his fights has gone to the scorecards. He is now 2-0 and in the UFC after winning on, on Contender Series. And he will be standing across from Nicholas Dalby, Danish dynamite, baby. His record, nothing to, sn- nothing to scoff at. 22-4 uh, and four with one draw and one no contest. Ten of his wins have gone, uh, excuse me, ten of his wins have been finishes, six of those knockouts. And he's riding a three-fight win streak coming into this weekend, most recently a decision victory over Muslim Salikov back in June of this year. Mark, give me the odds, your take, and your pick. They are wide. Is this the widest favorite we have said thus far? Yep, it is. I don't know if anyone on the undercard is even bigger. But Gabriel Bonfim might be the biggest on the card, and he is minus 620. Um, Nicholas Dalby is plus 440. Two inches of height for Gabriel, but uh, two and a half inches of reach for Dalby, actually. Another fight on this card for me, like the Zaleski fight earlier, where a guy that I love to pick in Nicholas Dalby is fighting a dude who might just be a monster in Gabriel Bonfim. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Dalby has shown time and time again how much trouble he can give to different fighters. I mean, he drew with Darren Till when Till was looking dominant in, in his earlier run. Uh, we've, see, we've seen the way he can put it on guys late in fights. But I got to go Bonfim. Just on the face of it, he should be faster. He should be completely fine in the striking. He should have an advantage in the grappling. Um, you know, it, if this does make it late, it's not like you know Bonfim gets a lot of finishes, as Mike said. If this does go late, who knows if Dalby can do Dalby things and make some crazy shit happen. But uh, I don't even I don't think I'm going to pick that it gets that far. I, I'm going to trust Gabriel Bonfim's talent that we've seen thus far, and I'm going to say he takes yet another neck, and I will say he finishes this by submission in round two. Oh baby, yeah, I'll go next. It's you're not. I, I'm I'm not going to pick against a guy who's 15 and 0 with 15 finishes. You just Oh, it's it just, it would be zero decisions? I didn't even realize that's what you said. Zero uh, decisions. None of his 15 wins has gone to the scorecards. Wow. Uh, thir- three KOs and 12 submission victories. He's never been beaten. How, how many times has he been to a third round? Let's look. Twice. Let's see. One, <laughs> two. A bunch of second round finishes and two third round finishes and a bunch of first round and finishes. And a bunch of first round finishes. <clears throat> uh, his win on Contender Series was first round and both of his UFC wins have been first round finishes. His first and both of them, he's he looks like, I'll just uh, quickly say, he has averaged about 60 seconds in the UFC octagon. The, the problem is, is these guys keep going in for takedowns against these Bonfim brothers thinking that nothing is going to happen to them. They keep putting them up against the cage. They keep putting their necks to one side and just leaving them exposed. And it just seems like Bonfim is the kind of guy that doesn't need more than a split second to get his, his yeah. arm under that neck, man. And once you give it to him, he's not letting go. And we've seen a lot of guys go for crazy guillotines off of takedowns and end up getting fucked up and getting stuck on bottom and not working out for them. Bonfim looks like he's got that type of guillotine. And when it's in, it's in. Yeah. That being said, I'm I'm pleased to see this matchup. I think it's a, it's nice matchmaking. I think Dalby's a worthy opponent. Oh, I agree. Uh, to give uh, to give this Bonfim brother a little heat check at this point in his rising career. Yeah. yeah I, I, I all right, let's go. I was going to say really quick. Wait, I, so what I, were you guys? I, I think picks. Uh, did you make them? Uh, I did Bonfim yeah. by submission. Oh, you went first, Omar? Oh, no, I didn't go first. No, you yeah. didn't. Yeah. Did you not go yet? I don't think, I, I, oh, I, don't I think, think I, I went second. I don't. But, Mike, I don't think you said how it finished either. I don't think either one of you did. Oh, I think you're right. Second yeah. round submission for Bonfim. 
And Omar, you said first. No, I'm going with second round submission as well. I think Dolby. Oh, would so you we say all said the same yeah, thing? Yeah, we all said second round. Submission. My big thing about this fight is you're basically taking one of the, at this point, one of the most dangerous finishers, and putting him up against a guy who's probably one of the most durable fighters that you could pick in that division. So it makes for a very, very interesting uh, matchup and doesn't really leave a lot of room to figure out exactly what's going to happen in this fight or at least at the very least how it's going to end. A decision is very possible at this point in Bonfim's career the more he moves up that ladder. Um, so it's very, very interesting. Sure is. Okay, boys. Main event time. UFC Fight Night. Almeida versus Lewis. Headline by... Jonathan Almeida stepping up in probably what is the biggest fight of his career, taking on Derek the Black Beast Lewis. Here we go. Let us set this up. The A side is Jonathan Almeida, Maladinho, the 32-year-old out of Bahia, Brazil. His pro record stands at 19-2 and two coming into this weekend with 19-2. Of his wins, that excuse me, all 19 of his wins, uh, all, again similar to Bonfim, uh, have been finishes. Seven of them knockouts, 12 of them submissions. He has only lost twice, one decision, and he has been knocked out once, very early in his career, in what was only the fifth fight of his career, for a promotion called Katana Fight. It was in 2017. He got knocked out. In the first round at the 16-second mark. So he got caught, guys. He's dropped other one other decision back in 2018 in a promotion called Chuto Brazil. But he's been on a tear since. He's undefeated in the UFC. He's now uh, 5-0 and under the UFC banner after winning on Contender Series. He'll be standing across from the UFC heavyweight knockout king in Derek the Black Beast Lewis, the 38-year-old. Out of Houston, Texas, USA, his pro record stands at 27 and 11 with one no contest. 22 of his 27 wins have been knockouts. Like I said, he is the heavyweight knockout king. At one point, he was the UFC knockout king, but I believe he has been displaced by one Matt the Immortal Brown. Uh, he's coming off of a TKO victory over Marcos Rogerio de Lima, a 33 second. First round finish that started with started with a flying knee out of the corner from Derek Lewis. Just incredible stuff at 38 years old. He's still finding ways to electrify crowds and audiences. All right, Omar, start us off this time. Give us your take and your pick of Jalton Maladino Almeida stepping up to the biggest fight of his career, taking on the legend, the, the active living legend in Derek Lewis. It's very interesting, and I think one of the big things that uh, may not be getting talked about enough is the fact that Derek Lewis is stepping into this fight on relatively short notice. Um, I I think, obviously, like with any, almost any Derek Lewis fight or every Derek Lewis fight, there's obviously going to be an opportunity for him to put somebody's lights out. Um, very good with his uppercuts, very good with his, with his strikes in general, but... His game is very is very noticeable, right? There's not a lot of tricks to his game. There's not a lot of 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 crazy things that tend to happen. And I say this full well knowing that he just flying need uh, this man in his last fight. But <laughs> you know, there's there's something to be said about you know doing dumb shit and hoping it you know it works, and then what your actual game is. And I think the game of Derek Lewis. Um, is one that is pretty well known. It's just a game that is very difficult for people to stop, especially when they have relatively limited skill sets. Hylton Almeida, mm -hmm. I don't think is that dude. Hylton Almeida might be one of the more uh, well-rounded fighters and one of the most dangerous fighters we've seen uh, on the roster right now. I think his come-up has been very strong. I think his performances have been exceptional almost all the way around. I think the thing that he's missing more than anything at this point is the names uh, that get attached to it. So Rosenstrike, I think, is a, it might have been a, a good litmus test as to what we're looking at for the end of a Derek Lewis fight. 
Derek Lewis, I think, has better takedown defense than Jarzinho Rosenstrike does. But I think in the end, it'll all be for naught anyway. Um, I'm going to go with Jonathan Almeida by mm-hmm. submission round two. Uh, I will go next. Uh, I agree. I think that this is going to be a sort of passing of the torch fight for the UFC heavyweight division where Derek Lewis really, even though he is coming off of a nice TKO victory, uh, he has lost, that, that snapped a three fight losing streak for Derek Lewis, uh, having lost four of his last six, uh, in three of those four losses, he, he got finished himself. And I think this one is going to kind of put, uh, a stamp on on the case file of Derek Lewis, where Jalton Almeida is really going to ascend into the upper echelon now of the UFC heavyweight division. The man is just a machine at heavyweight. He was even scarier at 205, but uh, I see him, you know, staying away from Derek Lewis's power, getting this 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 man to the ground. Once Derek Lewis is on his back. He can have a few bursts of energy and explode to try to get back to his feet, but I think Almeida is himself is a giant and and is also a ground fighting ex- expert, truly. Uh, and I see him submitting Derek Lewis. I will say a first round submission victory for Jalton Almeida. Mark. Yep, Gilton is a minus 500 favorite here. Derek Lewis is plus 370. Um, maybe it would have been closer without the short notice. Maybe not. The height is the same. The reach is the same. So, you know, I mean, you think of Derek Lewis as like the big black beast, but these these boys are the same exact size. Um, obviously a little more girth on Derek. Uh, personally, I wish we would have got the original fight here between Almeida and Curtis Blades. I, I loved that test for Almeida. Obviously, I know Derek Lewis has beaten Curtis Blades, but I just don't feel like he provides the same challenges because we know what Houghton Almeida wants to do. He he is Brazilian Habib. He wants to take you down, set you up methodically, maul you, and submit you. And against the wrestling of Blades, we would have gotten a lot of questions answered. But... Lewis is not really that guy in in terms of the wrestling pedigree. Now, granted, on the pluses for Lewis, he is not easy to take down. As you said, he's he's harder to take down than, say, a Rosenstrike. He is not easy to hold down. Same thing, harder than a guy like that. He is a very large man, and he carries monster, monster knockout power for every second that this fight takes place on the feet. So that is the wild card that he brings that, that Houghton will have to navigate. But I think he'll do it. I I think his type of wrestling where he is not necessarily out at range shooting doubles, risking that that counter coming, but instead he's more pushing his way inside, leaning on you, adjusting his weight on you, working for trips. I think that's historically the kind of wrestling that Derek Lewis struggles more with. And I think Almeida is going to have success with it. And I think he ends up on top of Derek Lewis or on Lewis's back, depending on how they fall um, by the end of this first round. And I don't think he lets Derek Lewis escape. I will say how to made a round one sub. <clears throat> Guys, it's before midnight. Tis. It's 1149. Can't remember the last we time we did an hour and a half. It's only been an hour and a half. Wow. Really? Jeez. Yeah. I guess that's what happens when you only recap one fight. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And we didn't uh, we didn't rush through that either. No, it took no. about twenty no. minutes or so for that. Yeah, we no, did I'll tell you, eight, eight fights. Yeah. The uh, the rematch that got away. Prime Derek Lewis versus Francis. Yeah. Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far I mean, I don't. There's a I lot. I don't know if anybody was really dying for that rematch. That fight was. Boring. Oh, how could you not? That fight was, oh, I was that here fight for was it. Garbage. The had, first they one had was to so run that back. <laughs> Francis and Bones really got away. That's too. really the one that's yeah, that's man. the worst for me. Francis and Pavlovich would have been wild too. There's there's some good ones that we're not going to ever yeah, get. Francis to and Pavlovich would have been insane. Francis and Jones Do is not blink. It's so hard to deny as probably being a fight that 
would have really answered a lot of questions. Like, you could never... Jones could have walked away after fighting Ngannou and no one would have said shit. You know what I mean? Serious question. There's so much that would have to happen. So this is, this is borderline pointless. But, like, say Ngannou fights Anthony Joshua and he wins. Then say he fights the winner of Fury and Usyk and he wins. And he is the heavyweight champion of boxing. With the connections and the existing relationship with the UFC, if John Jones was like, Dana, I want this fight, it would be the biggest fight that ever happened in history. I agree. I don't disagree yes. even a little don't bit. Don't you think Dana would be like, all right, yes. we'll do yeah, it? Yeah, I think he would. You think yeah, so? it's not impossible. I mean, it, would, think he might re- not? it would require Nganu to win some fights he probably isn't going to be favored to win but and i think he does it obviously in the ufc i don't think this is a boxing thing of any kind oh sure. yeah obviously you know? no no yeah. jones is not going to go box francis in a box certainly league. not certainly no not. no no but yeah it's like that fight's only getting bigger the more time passes right now do you really think it's deontay crazy. wilder might get in a cage with dude francis? he's been saying it for a he's... while for like months and months he's and months, training. like saying like he's, he's been training for the last two months in MMA. Whatever the whatever we the have fuck run that this means. experiment enough times. If if a if an MMA guy puts on a boxing gloves and boxes in a ring, we kind of know what the outcome probably will be slash should be. If a boxer steps into an MMA an MMA cage, we have run this experiment enough times that we know with utter certainty. What will happen to that poor man? When's the last time we ran this experiment? Is it Kator and I, Tony, or is there something I'm forgetting? CM Punk, but he's he's not a boxer. But a boxer specifically no. is is James no. Tony. <laughs> no, what CM Punk? Just what? random people that shouldn't have been That's in the, the cage is more. What no, I'm talking about a boxer. Yes, boxer is just James Tony was the last one yeah, I remember. So it's been too long. I would like to run it again because there are too many people out there that don't fucking get it. Like even random example. I when um when Canelo and Connor were beefing on Instagram or Twitter or whatever it was, like a couple weeks ago, so many comments, people were being like, Canelo kills Connor in any type of combat. Like, does it matter if it's boxing or MMA? And I'm like, you have no idea how dumb you sound. Like, it is it is a blowout, non close fight in in MMA, and there's too many people that don't get it. So I I would be happy to see someone step over. So they can see it and understand it. Because I, I don't like the disrespect that MMA gets from the, you know, the non-educated not. fans. I'm with you. I would like to see somebody take a leg kick, though. Like, I feel like this would have been very interesting had Randy Couture, before shooting in, just gave James Tony a fucking Charlie horse right on his leg just before he did it, too. Like, that would have been really satisfying for me. So I just hope we get a, I hope we get a leg <laughs> kick loved- in there. For the next time we get a crossover, Randy Couture wasn't exactly Mr. Leg. Agreed, kicker. but at that was, point, if you're an MMA, I, dude, dude, I, anybody could leg kick at that point because I guarantee you he's thrown way more mm. than James Tony's ever thrown. Dude, yes. I loved Couture's game plan in that fight. He's like, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna risk taking a jab from this man, and he shot for an ankle pick from about ten feet away, and it was, it was yeah, it was a wrap. Yeah. It was a wrap from there. Yeah. But yeah, people just don't get it. Like, like Ngannou just fought a fight with Tyson Fury that he arguably won. And Fury used all the bullets that he had in the chamber. That's and so Ngannou cool. only got to use one of his bullets. Like, it's... Right. People yes. don't understand it. Like, <laughs> Yes. MMA is so much closer, so much closer to, to real fighting. Yes, obviously. Yes. And I, heard who, I forget who it was. Some, some big MMA coach of one of the big gyms was like you could take an mma fighter who has only had like a year or two of jujitsu experience of training he's like a fucking blue belt at this point in his jujitsu journey he would fuck up any boxer he would fuck up floyd mayweather in a in a real fight no i don't know if i'm as confident in that as he is i think if the fight ends up on the ground absolutely but i get the point like because if you if he just started on the yes. ground and like rolled around until he grabbed a leg, all you got to do then is is try to avoid Floyd dropping a bomb. 100%. On and as soon as you grab the leg, the fight's over. 100%. So yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, it's yeah. what it's it's why people used to have the Ronda Rousey Floyd Mayweather debate. Right, it's true <laughs> because she could roll around and grab a leg, and then the fight's yeah. over. But it's a matter of not getting hit, which is a tall order for a guy, especially as fast as Mayweather or as strong as you know somebody like Wilder or something like that. You know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, props to Wilder if he ever does it. But my God, I, it's, it's like whole order, man. just gl- glaring, yeah. glaring, begging to be leg kicked. Okay. Uh, Derek Lewis has the most finishes uh, by division here. The most finishes in heavyweight history. Who has the most finishes in bantamweight history? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fill in the blank give me your best guess here huh that's not easy UFC you said right this is UFC we're not including WEC in this not Zufa Uh, I, I guess not The most finishes in bantamweight history. I mean, fuck, Sean O'Malley can't be too far back. Dude's had his share of knockouts. Hmm. Who's in the bantamweight division? Right? Like, like, that's that's really where I'm having an issue trying to figure out these names here, and it's, like, not coming to me. I want to open up my rankings so I can look at the fucking list. Is that allowed? Can I do that? Yeah, do it. The names aren't coming to me the way I want them to. Okay, let me give you... I'll give you multiple choice. Ready? I'll give you... Wait, wait, wait. Don't give me the multiple choice yet. I want to see if, if as I scan this list, a name comes in my head where I'm like, boom. I feel like the further down I go on this list, I think I'm getting further away from it. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, fuck. It could be a bunch of these dudes. All right, hit us with multiple choice. Yeah. Why not? Okay, is it A. Marlon Cheeto Vero? B. Uh, hold on one second. Wait a second. I lost my place here. Well, it ain't B. All right, fine. Let me reorder <laughs> could these. It be, could it be Song Yadong? <laughs> Already? No. Could it I'll be? I'll tell you right now, it's not Song Yadong. Okay. It's not Song. Cheeto, I considered, so I'm not surprised you made him a choice. Yeah. Are we going to get other choices, or did you just quit? <laughs> Okay. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay, is it A, Cheeto Vera, B, TJ Dillashaw, C, Domino Cruz, or D, Sean O'Malley? Oh, it's not Cruz. Yeah, I consider TJ too. Yeah, it's, it's definitely it's, not, Cruz. not Cruz. Yeah, I considered all three of those names. All right, so I wasn't far off. That's good. I said O'Malley out loud, and I was thinking Cheeto and TJ. This is good. Okay, this is a successful trivia question. Thank you guys for playing. It's giving you pause, but it's not too hard. This is good. I'm honestly torn between TJ and Cheeto. I think I'm going to go TJ. Yeah, I think I'm going to go TJ. I I want to say it's O'Malley, but I feel like we would have heard about that by now if it was O'Malley, which is making that not be my guess. In which case... I'll just pick who Omar didn't say. I think gun to my head, I'd say TJ, but I'll say Cheeto for the sake of this. Okay, with 10 finishes, 
This man holds the record for most finishes in UFC bantamweight history, and his name is Marlon Chito Vera. Oh, wow. wow. By luck. What's TJ at then? Wow. I have no idea. Okay, great. Well, good for Marlon. Jeez. <laughs> Wow. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. I yeah. Marlon, Marlon's been around. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Well, boys, we've done nice it again. One. I like it. Nice, Good nice, trivia. nice. Any parting parting shots? TJ's <sighs> No, but it's midnight. TJ's got seven. He made us last till midnight after all. And now I turn into a pumpkin. Well. Enjoy the fights this weekend, guys. A really, really nice fight night card up and down the whole card really uh it's gonna have quite the exclamation point i believe for the main event is this shit on at night been too many random timed cards lately what time is this on (laughs) sound like chill sudden main card is like (laughs) main card 9 p.m boom i went to go watch the wilder the the fury and ganu fight dude and i went at seven o'clock and i thought it would be on at a normal time and i found out it was on at two <laughs> and dude, mm. next week we have quite a bit to talk about because we have a great fight night card to recap next week. And next week we are previewing UFC 295. Oh God, yes. What a fucking great card! Up and down this whole fucking card. Is it? I mean, I think a lot of these I fights are I, great. I thought I remembered it not being so stacked up and down. Or am I thinking of 296? That's the not main so card for this is pretty goddamn stacked. Mm, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fucking dope. 295, 295. You got Tabitha Ricci and Luby Godinez. You got Jared Gordon and Mark Madsen on the early prelims. No, yeah, this you, is the you one. You got Sondani and Frivola. You got Diego Lopes back in there. No, no, this is Pat the Sabatini. No, yeah, this has some This has some. You got Mackenzie Dern and Jessica Andrade. The, co- the co-main is Pavlovich and Aspinall for the, for the interim heavyweight title. And the main event, this fight alone sells the fuck out of this card for so many MMA purists. The light heavyweight championship on the line uh, with Yuri Prohaska coming back, <laughs> taking on Alex Pereira at 205 again. Holy shit, this fucking fight. What a dream matchup this is. Yeah, this was actually, as I'm looking at it, because 296 is good. This is the one where I thought the undercard was weak, but I think it didn't have Jared Gordon and Madsen at the time, and I'm not even sure it had Ricci and Loopy at the time, so it definitely got better. Okay. Well, dope. You know, guys, I think I, I think I, I think I cursed a lot on this episode more than I usually do, and um, I just want to apologize to my mom. <laughs> I'd like to apologize to absolutely fucking nobody. <laughs> absolutely nobody. <laughs> All right, guys, have a great week. We will reconvene in seven days. All right. Peace. 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 Peace.